Great. Well, I think we'll get started and uh, some other people might trickle in in the next couple of minutes. Um, but I just want to start off by saying thank you for all joining us today for this week's lecture and planning series. Our speaker this week is Dr. Robert Goodspeed. Uh, I'm a PhD student here in the Urban Planning Program. Uh, my name is Jenna Davis and I'll be moderating this session. So I just want to start with a few uh, kind of brief technical and logistic announcements and then I'll turn to introducing our speaker. Uh, so during the talk, I'd just like to remind everyone to please mute their microphones. Uh, we'll be recording today's lecture, so anyone in the, in the audience who wishes to not be recorded should turn off their video output. And then we'll, the, the chat box should be used for, uh, only for discussion regarding the session. Um, if you have any technical questions that apply only to you, um, feel free to either message myself or Stefan Norgard, who's the other uh, coordinator for today's lecture. Uh, and then finally, we'll encourage you all to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. Um, after a speaker's presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, we'll start Q&A around 2 or 2.15, so we have around uh, 15 to 30 minutes for questions. Uh, and I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to kind of diversity and inclusion. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you already had a chance to ask a question, uh, just please allow others to do so before asking another question. Uh, so with that, I'm delighted to now turn to introducing today's speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Goodspeed. Uh, Dr. Goodspeed is an assistant professor of urban planning at Tubman College at the University of Michigan. Uh, he teaches in areas of geographic information systems, collaborative planning, and scenario planning theory and methods. His research investigates how new information technologies can be used to improve the planning process and planning outcomes and involves mixed methods studies of innovative urban planning practice, the use of GIS to develop novel methods, and theoretical analysis of socio-technical practices like crowdfunding and smart cities. Uh, he was named a leading thinker in urban planning and technology by the website Plan Citizen. Uh, he holds a PhD in urban and regional planning from MIT and an MCP from the University of Maryland and a BA for, in history from the University of Michigan. Uh, today, Dr. Goodspeed's lecture called uh, Towards Data-Driven Urban Transformation, Managing and Envisioning Uncertain Futures with Scenario Planning will draw on some lessons learned from his recent book, which is called Scenario Planning for Cities and Regions, Managing and Envision Envisioning Uncertain Futures. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass things over to Dr. Goodspeed to start the presentation. All right, great. Thanks so much, Jenna, and thanks to the whole committee for the invitation. Um, some of you may be aware um, I was uh, all lined up to come out and uh, uh, give us the similar lecture in April. Suffice it to say that did not happen uh, with everything that occurred, but I was so pleased that you find a spot. We're able to do this virtually. I uh, don't miss the flight, although it's fun to visit New York. Um, uh, I, I think maybe, uh, I realized I wanted to give a, a a, just a little brief personal preface before I launched into the discussion here today about scenario planning, um, really mainly focused on scenario planning practice and some related um, research and scholarship. And that's, you know, after I, uh, uh, about where I'm coming from as a, as a scholar and a practitioner, um, after getting my MCP from Maryland, I um, worked professionally for a year at, for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is a regional planning agency in Boston. Um, very innovative and involved in both scenario planning and other, you know, um, you know, innovative types of planning. And then while getting my PhD, you know, um, one of my dissertation case studies was with them and I worked there. So I think of myself, you know, I, I am a scholar. I definitely have papers which are of interest only to academics, but I'm also an AICP professional and, you know, carry that credential and, and try to remain engaged with, with practice. And I think scenario planning is the, the topic that's kind of most at the intersection. I have some other research interests that, you know, there's less engagement in professional practice, but that will explain my, my perspective. So here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about what is scenario planning, um, really starting with its most fundamental theoretical approach to the city. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some specific types of practice and just very briefly look at some examples, um, you know, um, and, uh, and then uh, touch on a few kind of you know specific um, topics, some of which uh, uh, 
you know, uh, make links to areas of research. For example, I published work in the planning support systems literature, analyzing the effectiveness of various tools. That's not a main thrust here. I've learned that that research that is an, it has a more of a niche audience, but I'll kind of make, um, explain how that plugs into the bigger picture. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for discussion. And um, as we go along, if there's brief clarifications, I am monitoring the chat box and uh, feel free to pop them in there. Um, you know, where I wanna begin, which um, is really a chapter that I, I wrote. So most of the material is drawn from the book, but not all of it. But when I ended up sitting down to write the manuscript, this chapter sort of ended up evolving and coming out of the ideas and a little bit to my surprise. And it's, I think of it as the chapter, which is, you know, what is a city? And I think it's because it informs, you know, how I analyze professional practice and also which theories and approaches um, are suitable for contemporary planning. And, and so um, many of you are familiar with Jane Jacobs' classic work. It's Planning School. Everyone's probably read it. You may or may not have got to chapter 22, uh, all the way at the end of the book, where she muses on what is, what is, what kind of problem is a city? And she speculates that it is a problem of what she calls organized complexity. And in a way, she's really ahead of her time. Um, the state of the, of the art in terms of complexity theory and thinking was very rudimentary in, in the 60s or even late 50s when she was writing and has evolved dramatically. Um, but I think that I am, uh, hopefully I'll convey that I think that scenario planning and kind of a, the intellectual approach it's assuming um, takes the same perspective. And in a, in a kind of interesting subsequent work, Stephen Marshall, a, a very interesting um, UK scholar, um, points out using Jane Jacobs as the jumping off point that not only are cities uh, comprised of organized complexity, they have many different types of complexity within them. There's artifactual complexity, system complexity about infrastructures, about vehicles and technologies. They contain ecologies and complex biology and, you know, uh, the complexity theorists talk about the double complexity of cities because there's the further complexity of human intelligence and how we make sense of the world and how that influences our behaviors. And the, really the punchline here for him is this result in really dramatic uncertainties. We, we, have, um, we don't really know the full system as it is today. We can't predict the effects of interventions. We don't know the optimal future state or optimal state of the system. So, um, you know, reading this, it might send you into some planning nihilism, but my point is it highlights the importance of uncertainty and um, the need for methods which are grappling very directly with um, uncertainty um, in, in, in multiple ways. You know, and another kind of, I think, basic conclusion of this of a kind of complexity view is highlighting these cross-sector cross -sector connections. This is a diagram created by uh, planner Peter Calthorpe, a uh, very well-known urban planner and urban designer. And it's a kind of classic designer's viewpoint of the city seeing all of these different facets, land consumption, building performance, travel, behavior, environmental impacts through the lens of urban form. And I think, you know, this maybe goes without saying in planning audiences, but they, you know, almost all of these topics have, you know, fully siloed disciplines, which deal with them largely in isolation with the other ones. Um, and it you know, maybe calls attention the kind of hallmark of a, of a planning perspective informed by a complexity view. And then kind of concluding my take here, you know, let's pivot to if that's what it says about what we can know about cities and, you, you know, basically how, you know, what's possible in order to analyze them, what does it say about how we should go about planning cities? So, you, you know, again, that kind of litany of planning truisms that uh, you know, problems, it's difficult to um, address them in isolation or interconnections between sectors and between, you know, scales of analysis. Um, there's obviously no optimal outcome, um, but there may be better or worse um, outcomes. And, you know, finally, that we're planning really from within the system. There's no such thing as top-down planning. A top-down is just an institutional actor which is invested with certain powers and the whole history of Jane Jacobs and urban renewal um, demonstrates the you know limited um, epistemology and limited effectiveness of, of that. Um, and really the myth that, that uh, cities uh, can be unproblematically shaped from the top down. And so, you know, I think that planning, uh, collaborative planning theory, I feel kind of lonely at times of carrying along the, plan, the collaboration flag. It's um, the most popular uh, theory to take pot shots at today in planning academia. I still believe in it and we can talk about 
that in more detail if you're curious. And so, but it, essentially I think it's valuable because it gives you a set of tools for analyzing your social role of within a complex social system and thinking through how planning practices can engage, um, you know, through the network of individuals and institutions which ultimately collectively shape cities. Um, so this is all been, uh, very abstract. Let's let's move to kind of the, the main entree of the day. And in a way, hopefully we can see some of those themes play play through as we um, get into the method in some of my cases. So, you know, urban scenario planning, it's a form of strategic planning that creates multiple representations of plausible urban futures. And, you know, we have two main professional motivations to get into scenarios. Either you're concerned about uncertainty um, of different types, um, or you want to envision transformation. And so, you know, uh, depending on how it is applied, you can be focused on building consensus, focused more on the analytic functionality of looking across functional domains, looking at interconnections between issues, or uh, focusing on trying to synthesize, you know, de debates about values and policy goals with um, analysis about uh, both what exists and what's possible. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think in kind of in, when I'm speaking to more practitioner audiences, these are the two big challenges facing the field. It seems appropriate to have that scary hurricane with, you know, similar aerial image um, like exists in the real world. Um, but I think the roots of a lot of scenario practice come from a little bit earlier era. Um, and, you know, these earlier ideas, Peter Calthorpe, a founder of the Congress for the New Urbanism, reformist planners and urban designers seeking methods to not only envision alternatively designed cities, but then realize them and build, you know, the, the, the institutional changes and uh, public will to make all the changes that are needed to get, for example, transit-oriented development. So that's, you know, just kind of an, an entree. And, and so it, as the talks organize next, I'll kind of give you a deeper sense of scenario theory. Um, but I, I realize actually this is a really opportune moment to uh, ponder a kind of deep, a, a final deep theoretical issue. So, okay, it's, it's complexity. Um, and, uh, but really what is the nature of planning practice? And, uh, and so I really appreciate this quite, it's kind of like a, a hidden old gem. It's this oldie but goodie book from 1976 talking about uh, the planning profession and um, how it thinks about the future by Sandberg. And he makes the point that all planning, you know, in a stylized way can fall into two categories, that there is uh, what, what he calls a planning that are colonizing the future. It's about um, serving the established interests of today um, and uh, helping preserve them by you know, um, anticipating uh, uh, and counteracting threats and, and crises that might impact them. And I think we can all recognize this, you know, when a you know, a private business conducts uh, scenario planning and strategic planning, it's seeking to perpetuate its own interests primarily. He, he theorizes that there could be such a thing as an emancipatory planning. Um, it does not pre prevent any self-fulfilling prophecies and it opposes reification of any current policies um, by demonstrating alternatives. And I think scenario planning practice can maybe fall in each category. Um, in, the, in the book, and I try to make an argument and speculate about how we could push it more in that emancipatory um, category. And in that uh, book chapter, I, I discuss a case in the Bay Area where, you know, regional metropolitan planning organizations are now, you know, many of them have created scenarios um, and environmental justice advocates created their own scenario, which was much more aggressive in terms of anti-displacement and expanding transportation access in communities of color. And they successfully politicized it and forced that scenario to be modeled as part of the environmental impact statement, although it did not make it into the adopted long range transportation plan. So I think it's an intriguing case that um, highlights, you know, to me that the scenario methodology is flexible. And um, as in the current moment, I think we're lots of practitioners and as students um, questioning the current approaches of our fields and um, wondering if they can be Im improved or changed to be more emancipatory, let's say. And, and uh, my, my claim is maybe scenario planning can serve you, but you know, the devil's in the details. So let's get into the scenario idea. And I like to do that through a discussion of four, what I consider 
uh, antecedent and kind of related planning approaches. And, and I think this, this is a super high level map, but you know, as students and practitioners, you may move through different spaces and you'll bump into like passionate advocates of each of these. And you know, the book really walks through analyzing them theoretically in terms of their similarities and differences. So you know, uh, first most common planning approach is visioning. A lot of designers work in this mode. Um, but of course, the critiques are whose vision, uh, what data or analysis is the vision based on? Is it feasible or is it a pretty drawing? You know, the kind of mirror image to visioning that you may have heard about and, you know, is, uh, is forecasting. So this is often quantitative um, and focused on predicting the future. And in the social sciences, you know, there's uh, uh, Philip Tet Tetlock's work in super forecasting, great deal of interest in the ability, the possibility of forecasting the future. Here's what I'll say about forecasting. You know, first, our track record on forecasting quantitative change is, is not very good at all. And so what this chart shows are a series of long-range transportation plans um, pr produced by SEMCOG, the MPO for the metropolitan uh, region here in Southeast Michigan around Detroit. And the colored lines show, you know, basically before the boom in the late 90s, the plans under predicted how much driving there actually would be. Uh, that was the previous time in history when everyone was buying SUVs and the big three were doing well. During the near the peak, peak of the boom, they way, way overestimated the levels of driving that would exist in the future. And then they didn't anticipate um, the recession, as well as other changes in the region and lifestyle and land use, which have resulted in the, de the decrease of driving. So the point is a, for a forecast based plan is always vulnerable um, to being wrong and in, in more than one direction. It's not necessarily easier to forecast technological economic trends. And uh, here's a few that I like plucked from the scenario planning literature. And the last one feels especially appropriate. And we all heard and maybe have collected all these wild AV predictions, um, none of which seem very realistic anymore. Uh, and the, the year that we're all supposed to be able to go, go buy an AV is either this year or next year. And it's you know, clearly the world is evolved in a different path. Um, but I, I might say, you know, there is a, a rigor to forecasting, especially demographic analysis, where it can provide bounds about the possible, but uh, maybe isn't a sufficient, um, you know, planning approach. Um, an, another, though, in your organizational lives, you may have bumped into strategic planning. I, I show this kind of overly elaborate um, chart in that it has all the strategic planning buzzwords you know, you're, and what I like about strategic planning is it's a combination of internal and external. It's looking at forces and trends. Uh, it's trying to focus on certain goals and strategies and not be comprehensive. But obviously, it's only a organizational method. It's not a full-blown theory of, of uh, planning a city. And then finally, there's been a you know, great deal of interest in consensus building, um, which has a lot to contribute to planning practice. Um, but is, is focused on the interests and positions of today. And a great consensus pro uh, process may or may not uh, even talk about um, massive uncertainties and um, coming down the pipe uh, in the future. In the book, I create academics feel the impulse to create simple two by two diagrams. So here, you know, my, my point is, is some are focused on, on the future and others are more about um, today, but also more open to plural viewpoints. Um, that's the two on the bottom. Um, and then, you know, there's an, another difference that you're focusing on trying to build mutual understanding and consensus or on the external uh, trends. And so, you know, in some, a lot of threads um, in scenario planning practice that, you know, planning practitioners today are doing, they've drawn selectively on these traditions, um, but really they're becoming at um, planning in a little bit different uh, point of view. And I've already made some allusions to why none of these are, are satisfactory. So let's get into what is what is the theory underlying um, the practice of scenario planning. And to explain that, there's a, a metaphor I really like from a management book about scenario planning by Keith Vander Hayden. And he says, when you're driving down a road and it's snowing really hard, we've all had this experience or maybe hard rain, you know, you, you wouldn't turn off your headlamps. Um, but obviously the headlight is only going to show you so far down the road. You might prepare um, for your trip by uh, taking other steps, by thinking about, um, you know, the speed you'll travel and when you'll pull over based on is it curvy or straight? Do you have a map that can 
suggest the kind of obstacles ahead. So even if you're not sure exactly what road you're on, um, you can you can do planning, which will you know improve your ability to get to where you want to go. And so the, the metaphor kind of breaks down at a certain point, um, but I think you get the idea. And so he complements that with this chart, um, which I I you know really like, and it points out that forecasting might play a role, um, especially in the short term. So on the x-axis here, we have the, the distance into the future. Um, and um, there's a certain momentum to the economy, to demographics um, that we can observe and monitor and to a certain extent predict. Um, where the strength of scenarios come in is when the force of the predetermined factors today is becomes overwhelmed with uncertainty. Um, but it's, it's not a, uh, uh, long-term, super long-term thing, that's the realm of science fiction. Um, that's why I don't call myself a futurist. They're concerned with the, the very long-term. Um, and, you know, it has, it's, there's a role for that in our culture, but it's not planning. Um, and so in the planning field, you know, often the, the uh, predetermined factors are current infrastructure, um, uh, current institutions to a certain extent, but then uncertainties you can consider is the location, um, and, uh, and character of different types of growth um, and external uncertainties like climate change, uh, natural hazards, uh, even cultural and technological change. Um, I liked Stefan's question and I'll think about it and we can address it at, at the end. And then to kind of fin finish the thought here, um, in scenario planning literature, there, there are many versions of this uh, chart which um, is called either a scenario cone or, or a um, scenario funnel. And the point is that we are at a particular moment in history and time, and there's you know, various futures that are plausible, and they may be more or less uh, likely, more or less desirable, um, and but the, the forces that will influence which one we get to could be decisions that certain individuals or institutions make. It could be disruptive events. It could also just be long-term trends playing out like shifts of, in preference or shifts in attitude. And so the art of scenario planning is uh, creating a set of these plausible futures that serve the goals of the particular project. Um, and some versions of this cone have more or less detail, but this I think captures the basic essence of it. And so then kind of shifting to a little bit more specific um, realm, you know, okay, I, I get this general idea, it seems interesting, how do we actually use this in our field? And um, I divide practice into three basic categories. It's a little bit artificial, but I think it helps map it out. The first are um, what's sometimes called normative projects that are focused on really trying to the whole purpose is to get a single scenario everyone likes, um, but the, the, the purpose of creating the scenarios is not only to ensure the desired scenario is very rigorously developed and thought through, but also clarify why that scenario is the choice. Then there's um, another big category um, called exploratory. And within that, I, I subdivide that into two categories. Some are more focused on decisions and discrete options, and they tend to be more technical and more uh, quantitative, and I'll show some, some examples. Um, others are more quali uh, quali qualitative, and um, they're more about let's build an understanding of the future. We're not sure what decisions we may want to analyze or regret, so let's do an exploratory analysis of um, what could be plausible and only then decide exactly the kinds of more specific plans that we might need to produce. Um, and so, you know, my point here on all of these is they're aiming in quite different professional outcomes. You know, is it you're building a consensus, you're trying to make better decisions, do you just want to be enlightened? And therefore, um, you know, they, it's just something to be mindful of that, you know, there's, there's no one clear outcome that cuts across all of scenario planning if you want to evaluate how successful was this given project. Um, so then I want to just show some examples. Again, these there'll be citations. Um, it's like super brief, just show some graphics and then we can discuss these or others in more depth. Um, okay, like normative scenarios, what is the conceptual approach? There's really two out there um, that I'm aware of that kind of common. Um, the Oregon model, you know, is used a lot in land use planning. So you start with your base here, you create your reference scenario. Um, 
you know, that it's it's really kind of what if we don't really change that much? What would the, what, what, what would the world look like? Um, we're careful not to say it's a prediction because often and often if we don't change anything, it's going to be have horrible traffic and you know nobody really wants that future. But you know what would it result in? And then you create a set of alternative scenarios. And again, often it's like you know, smart growth, new urbanist, reform, crusading practitioners using this as a framework to highlight for stakeholders the choices that they face. And then from the alternatives, you, you typically develop a kind of synthesis of, of ideas that have support into a preferred scenario. It leads directly to implementation. Rezone this, build the BRT, you know, so on and so forth. One critique of that approach is you often don't result in a very uh, aggressive scenario, let's say, is, you know, you're, you're a lot of compromise involved. And I just want to point out that you can do this differently. And so backcasting is like, let's start with a very aggressive goal. And they define that as sustainable mobility, which for them is like, you know, zero CO2 emission. And then how do we uh, work backwards to figure out the set of policies um, that are needed to achieve that goal? So, so I think that's been a little bit less common, but, you know, the more and more urgency communities feel around transformation, the more maybe we should promote this as, a, as an alternative. Um, just a couple examples, just give you a sense of the diversity. Um, this comes from the city of Madison, Wisconsin, and they were doing a, a, a master plan. Um, you know, a lot of the regional projects use scenarios to look at alternative land use patterns. Um, and this is this one was a little bit different. They said, well, you know, actually, we 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 have a land use pattern that we um, have agreed on, and there it is, a kind of classic land use um, map. And what we want to do is use the scenarios to explore what would happen under our existing you know land use categories if more or less of the growth was contained in the in the urban core versus at the periphery. And that they thought that was important because they want, were um, debating things like whether to build high capacity transit and whether and where to prioritize infrastructure to really try to catalyze greater growth. And they model these scenarios using a tool called Urban Footprint, which I use in my, in my classes, one of many different scenario planning tools, and created quantitative metrics about different uh, environmental outcomes. And again, this is a scenario that all the, the total amount of growth is the same across all three. It's just like, you know, if we put people in different types of neighborhoods, um, how, you know, what the impact could be. And there's an interesting thing here, you know, does any of these scenarios claim to be an extremely accurate uh, kind of prediction? Um, and I, I, I think the kind of philosophy going on here is that, of course, you know, no one can predict today if you grow here, here's how many, how many miles they'll drive. The philosophy is a little bit different. It says that if you were to, um, however, the tools and methods we have enable us to sensibly compare the scenarios. So, you know, we, we do have a sense that certain land use patterns will result in more sustainable travel and the tools can help us compare them. Um, even if we recognized all of these are kind of point estimates with an unknown margin of error around them. And so you just have to believe the tool is pragmatically useful enough for that comparison, um, not necessarily that it's giving you a super accurate point estimate in the future. And, and um, you know, and, and I think, again, the scenario logic calling attention to that level of uncertainty about what we know, but also the need to make thoughtful decisions today, even given our inability to make um, predictions, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, highly accurate predictions about the future of cities. So what do they do with this uh, outcome? Well, they uh, adopted what they call growth priority areas, not mandated, you know, in their uh, state enabling law at all, and that coordinated investments in transportation and other infrastructure choices um, around nodes that had been identified through the whole process of constructing the scenarios. Um, so I thought that was kind of an you know, classic spatial planning endpoint and in the you know, lots of debates about how do we uh, densify and increase housing supply, you know, abolishing single family zoning may be fine and good, but actually enabling and deliberately planning for greater density is a, is a whole other challenge. Um, and that's the type of thing that they're tackling here. Um, and then um, kind of shifting scales from the city scale back out to, uh, to a regional scale, um, I found uh, the small MPO in Idaho for this whole working paper, I was seeking 
um, small, unusual suspects whose work hadn't ever been written up in the planning literature. And, and this you know, little crossroads, it was a little, it's a, it's a trading um, center along the Oregon Trail, uh, Crossroads Town has a small university and they created conceptual scenarios that have some spatial elements and they realized they had no consensus about how to grow. And so they created, you know, a great place to business, outdoor life, there's the trend, you know, there's a university living scenario. And then from that exercise identified a set of um, land use changes and transportation investments um, that they called their preferred scenario. So if Bannock, Idaho can do it, then the MTC in New York or SEMCOG in Detroit can do it as well. It's not super expensive. Um, I think I might, I, I'm not going to pause to explain in great depth, uh, only to say that these um, qualitative exploratory uh, studies are uh, based in, you know, in-person workshops. This is what a lot of business leaders have done, and they involve brainstorming and categorizing uh, different uncertainties affecting the city. And this is a case study from the city of Denver. It was an internal exercise before they launched their comp plan. And there's a whole, I could, you know, there's a whole, someone's written a whole management book about this. And they kind of resulted in descriptions of possible futures. And the outcome here was really to identify issues and uh, uh, set the stage in a broader, more conceptual way for the more specific planning. As a follow up for the book, I did a more, uh, I have a more recent JAPA paper is published this summer. And uh, what's the point of the graphic on the right? Well, what, what we showed was when it comes to exploratory scenarios, there's lots of different ways of in, in, uh, incorporating that into professional practice. And some of these projects, the exploratory exercise, more or less is a kind of like interesting boardroom exercise to kind of generally set the stage for a more conventional plan. And in others, the exploratory exercise is very much about constructing um, a concrete scenario which does evolve into a kind of preferred, you know, um, consensus plan. And the point of our article is to map out this whole spectrum of approaches. And really all of them are starting with a kind of qualitative analysis of uncertainty. And then some go more into analytics, others go more into other forms of qualitative analysis. And uh, so, you know, read the paper. Um, so there's no one right way, which I think, you know, makes this idea both attractive but also a little intimidating for practitioners. And then, um, you know, shifting through my categories here, and then there's a, a category about um, decision-oriented uh, analytical scenarios. So, okay, you're saying, well, that's, yeah, these management scenarios that are just kind of a gestalt about what might happen in the city, that's nice, but what about using it for modeling? And um, this is a a project that's the MPO is housed in the city of Bloomington, Indiana, which is where Indiana University is located. Um, but the way that the MPO is drawn is they, whole, they include their whole county. And so there's lots of um, very politically conservative rural areas. And they're also not, you know, not at all seeing eye to eye with their state department of transportation around building a freeway and freeway exits. And so um, they use their planning, um, their plan to um, really analyze and highlight the range of choices. Um, so they first created nine socioeconomic land use scenarios. So there's different levels of growth and then there's different development styles. Um, maybe a note about this. I'm not sure that this project is, let's just say it's a little bit unusual and I'm not sure that everything they did is that effective, but I think it's a sort of extreme case that we could reflect on. So each of these land use and um, economic scenarios has, you know, different percentages of um, employment in different places, different, you know, mixture of housing densities, and a bunch of other things. And so uh, different school enrollment numbers. And so then just when you think you can wrap your head around this, they uh, combine the, this kind of land use scenario with a whole bunch of different network scenarios. They say, well, people are talking about um, building a bunch of different projects, you know, as I-69 extension, uh, interchanges in different places, two-way streets in the city of Bloomington. And so let's run these, all of these through. So the result is this mind-boggling set of scenarios. It spills over into two pages to show all the different indicators. And so then they furthermore, you know, are saying, well, we not only care about top-level transportation indicators, we want sustainability, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, traffic fatality estimates, all kinds of things. And so that you can see they've resorted to the kind of Excel shading to show, try to give you a sense of the performance of these, of these different scenarios. So, um, okay, this breaks all the rules in terms of the cognitive theory around scenario planning because there's too many to keep in your head. So I'm not sure this exercise is like convincing an elected official that smart growth is the way to go, um, which, you know, the, a for a scenario project can help clarify. But the purpose of this project was to create a plan so that when the MPO was debating very specific projects, they would have at their fingertips the impacts of, the, of those choices already computed. And I think in, that, in those terms, um, they think the plan was very useful and you know, they created something which they can refer back to. And when the state DOT says, well, we, we still wanna really build that, that interchange, they can say, well, we, you know, here we've run the numbers, we know it's gonna increase VMT and have, you know, increase accidents and we can achieve a similar performance through other, other measures in the region. So that's the kind of debate they're getting into. Being mindful of the time here, I have some slides about tools, which the last example gets into, um, but I think maybe I'll skim over them and we can revisit them in, in discussion. Um, you know, only to say that they're, you know, in theory, you can use, you know, a, a wide variety of tools. The cases I've shown have certainly used various technologies, although there is an especial, you know, affiliation with these place type development and analysis tools, which is a subcategory and scenario building. And I do have a sidebar and kind of comment in the note, I think that urban sim and models like it tend to, to have bake in a conservatism, which hinders their ability to realistically model different scenarios, whatever assumptions you put in, you always get like the, an outcome that looks like the training data of the past. And four-step travel models have a whole set of, of well-known flaws, which um, in the scenario realm, they are used, the last project did use them, but there's some concerns around the, their suitability. Um, and these place type uh, tools, because they're a little bit of the oddball in terms of the planning realm, um, you know, really created by kind of analytical designer minded planners, you build up from a building um, set of building ROI models and you create development types which describe neighborhoods, you can paint them, you then can compute. This is how Imagine Madison could come out with quantitative numbers um, because they have uh, quantitative assumptions around the land uses and then they're applying, you know, either some of these are just calculated um, and then others are applying empirical studies um, from the planning literature to create future estimates or predictions. Um, okay, so uh, you've gotten, you know, the main ideas, uh, just make some notes for those who are curious about um, additional uh, ch kind of chapters, the whole section about evaluation and the evaluation literature and planning and how we should think about um, evaluating practice. I made a brief reference to the transformation chapter, which goes much more in depth about um, racial equity as a particular dimension of transformation, um, which um, I wrote before the recent Black Lives Matter protests. And, but I think, you know, it's been no secret in planning that's something that we've been seeking to grapple with more effectively. And I tried to provide some fodder for that in the book. And then I do say a little bit more uh, in the book about collaboration, collaborative planning theory, um, happy to talk uh, about those issues in the discussion. Uh, in the abstract for the talk, um, I optimistically suggested I would share about some ongoing research. And I, I have three projects that I'm, I'm seeking, you know, so a lot of my research is, some of it is, you know, really observing and learning from practice. Um, and some of it is in more conventional social science or GIS methods. Um, but then I've become involved in three more ambitious engaged research projects with stakeholder involvement, where I, I hope in different ways to bring in and implement scenarios, really to kind of um, create, uh, let's say, methodological scholarly outcomes, like how, like how, what scenario approaches could practitioners use. And, but, but I think, you know, because of the pandemic and, and my own time, you know, there, the other two, one is about uh, regional land use change and green infrastructure planning in Southeast Michigan. So we have the first paper out about that, just a remote sensing change analysis. And we're looking at how do you bring in scenarios to plan green infrastructure to incorporate climate uncertainty. So 
Um, and then there's one, a smart mobility project working very closely with a lot of engineering faculty. Um, but, you know, the pandemic, not only did we cancel our in-person workshops, has slowed down some of the, the other aspects. So I don't necessarily have the slide on that. And then the, the third project or thread, um, you know, kind of as a side project in the last year and a half, I partnered with a legal organization and conducted the first big empirical study of evictions in the state of Michigan and getting evictions, filing data statewide. And we have a, a paper uh, under review at housing policy debate in their evictions issue that reports the kind of social science findings around neighborhood determinants. Um, but from that work, you know, we, in that paper, we, we realized that really evictions are like many urban issues, a function of a broader, you know, systemic process where uh, landlord behaviors, um, certainly planning policies, housing affordability, but also the you know, legal advocacy and the legal system itself play a role. And so my kind of idea there, you know, eviction is a very hot kind of topic and, and you know, with good reason. Um, but I think planning, you know, can and should engage with it in a different way than, uh, than say a housing expert. And, and I was intrigued, I found this uh, paper in the Annual Review of Public Health. Um, it's, you know, a little too quantitative for my like. This is, they actually turn their conceptual model into a system dynamics quantitative model, but what they're um, calling attention to is looking at, at homelessness from a systems perspective and thinking about how do we coordinate reform, you know, policies across multiple sectors and think about how they might be mutually reinforcing or mutually contradictory in order to you know, aim at the outcome where we're heading, heading for. So I have a vision eventually post-tenure you know, of, of attempting something similar and we've formed a lot of stakeholder relationships locally and I think you know there are there is a lot of funds in the homelessness and housing realm and a lot of different programs but they're not necessarily um, we learned through our consultation on the eviction project well coordinated to minimize eviction and we think there's ideas about how to um, make changes across multiple you know institutional actors you know that might include legal reforms but also changes to how emergency housing funds are allocated things like that um, that actually might help move the needle on the high volume of evictions, which we now know um, from Matthew Desmond and others research is very detrimental to a, a whole host of kind of outcomes that we care about. So, so that's what I can say about evictions. Um, and uh, uh, just to conclude, you know, my uh, point here, you know, where, where to go further. So I've made reference to a number and on the slides of some of the specific publications that, so most of it's from the book, but then there's some other things. Um, I've created a kind of faculty page that kind of catalogs all of that, um, but maybe more broadly, if I've um, piqued your interest in scenario planning practice, um, there is a professional initiative uh, hosted by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. They've been a huge supporter of um, scenarios and advancing scenario practice. And uh, this is an organization, you know, full disclosure, I'm on the board, but it, what I really enjoy about it is it's, it's kind of, um, you know, public sector planners, it's private sector consultants and tool creators, it's academics, and, you know, some kind of more citizen activists, and we're all, uh, you know, interested in this issue. We have an annual symposium um, this year, it'll be virtual in January, although virtually hosted in Salt Lake City, and, um, and we also have other educational peer exchange activities, sponsor publications, do an RFP to sponsor innovative tools and, and research, et cetera. So anyway, there's our uh, website and I'm happy to discuss that. So I think with that said, I will wrap and then really ex excited to engage with those of you who are on the line about what, what resonated with you, what questions you have, and uh, we can take this in any direction you like. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Goodspeed. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, anyone who's still on, please feel free to just type your questions into the chat box and we'll try to uh, address those and we're happy to have a little bit more of a discussion as well. Um, so I think the, the first question that I see is coming from Stefan who asked, um, why do you think scenario planning practice typically has a reputation of being normatively constrained or less emancipatory? And what are some of the historical and social factors that explain the origin of that subject? Mm -hmm. 
um, this is an excellent question, and I'm going to give you some. It's a question that I, I, I just have some rudimentary thoughts about that I, I hope to um, uh, further develop and give you the article. I think this question can be only answered by an article eventually. You know, um, so, so the, but that's the side of a great question. So, you know, here's one observation: is I think the scope of what is accepted to be considered by plans, either in terms of alternative policies or uh, is actually, a, it varies by place and it varies based on the planning culture. And it's because, you know, planning is interacting with the kind of political culture of a place. And one dimension of politics we appreciate is, um, a, you know, the, in the public policy field, there's a lot of talk about the Overton window, you know, what are the set of policies or possibilities which can be discussed in polite company? And that evolves over time. And I think, you know, and activists play a role in stretching or pushing the issue on certain dimensions, um, but also the interests of the institutions and the powerful actors them, themselves and about, you know, um, what they'll allow be discussed and what, what power they have to squelch discussion. So I think that explains like maybe one thing, which is the, sh the sheer choice to use scenarios is itself something which says something politically and there are certainly planning contexts where planners are never asked or never supported to create scenarios. And the powerful interests don't want to know the alternatives. They they own the land. They they only want a single future. And they you know they will. So there's a kind of a little bit of tension there. Um, now I don't think it's predetermined. I think practitioners um, do do and can exert agency and say you've asked me to write a plan. I'm going to create scenarios. I'm going to show that our current policies are bad. You know, <laughs> simplify. And I'll I'll give an example. Ann Arbor is a small city. We were growing really rapidly. Our former council majority was all NIMBYs who were opposed to high density development in almost all neighborhoods. And so the the uh, the planner was writing a new comp plan. Kind of, they're very intrigued by scenarios. They've met me, but they weren't politically in a situation where they could even do that type of plan. Well, there's been a change, the, the council's totally changed over, and so they're gonna move ahead and do their scenario-based plan. So that's, that's kind of one level of analysis. Um, you know, and I think maybe a deeper one is, if planning is done collaboratively, it has to be, you know, you're, you're not entering like from like a speculative future, like an architect would, like, like here's my dome over Manhattan you're entering into the intellectual world that exists, which is, so that speaks to the political, but it also speaks to the level of understanding and sophistication of um, what, what a city is today and what it could be in the future. And that, that itself varies as well. And so you see a lot of regions go through an evolution where the first scenario plan is like very minimal, like let's just look at a few land use options and it's like an appendix on our report but it, they use that to educate people to think differently. And then they can build on that with you know, more and more ambitious or elaborate. They're not only normatively pushing the envelope, but then also once you get people to kind of accept the framework, then you can add on issues. They can say, well, we're gonna do it again, but we're gonna add in sustainability. Like, you know, um, whereas if you hit them right up from the, from the front, they might say, well, I don't care about sustainability. I wanna know only the travel metrics and, Plus, you know, it's kind of confusing. There's too many new ideas coming at them. So, so that's another kind of evolution. Um, but then there's an element of collaborative practice. I think a lot of practitioners aren't that collaborative and you got to get through, you can't just plan within the framework that you're starting from. You have to figure out a process that will help you, you know, kind of foster the education that will get beyond it and to open people's minds. And there's a whole art there. And there's an art of how you engage stakeholders who you engage. There's an art in how you convey the scenarios. And I have a chapter in the book kind of talking about, you know, so there's not much social science on that stuff, but it's obviously super important to the effectiveness of the methodology. So, so anyway, um, so collaboration is hard and has a bad rap as only leading to the lowest common denominator. But I, you know, there's, I agree that orchestrating public education is, is hard, it is costly, and it is risky. And there's plenty of places where the practitioners you know, I think the Bloomington one, they, they didn't really, it was kind of a backroom exercise. And that's, you know, they made their own choices around what to do, but you can appreciate, um, you know, now they have the super technical plan, but they probably have elected officials that don't really understand it. And so even if you say, look, look at column 11, you know, that says we shouldn't do that. How, how much is that gonna resonate based on that 
you know, the, the, the Idaho example, which is more similar to what's been done in lots of metros where, you know, the elected officials, well, I remember we, we looked at the blueprint, uh, you know, the, the accepted, you know, scenario with these centers performed a lot better, you know, now you're making sense to me. So, so those are a few different thoughts about that. Um, uh, whoops, about that issue. Thank you. And I'll, now we, I talked so long, we have a lot more questions, which is great. <laughs> and so we'll, um, Jenna, you can tell me where to go next. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. We, we have another question from Joe who asked, uh, how does scenario planning work in shrinking regions, maybe like Southeast Michigan, where the issue is managing decline rather than growth and where perhaps none of the reasonable scenarios are good? Uh, mm -hmm. Is there an inherent bias in this method, especially since it's usually instigated by political actors towards positivity and inspiring visions of the future? Yep, absolutely. So you can hear there's definitely a link there in that shrinking regions, there's like a more intense commitment to boosterism, <laughs> you know, and the elites are like clinging to it. And that's definitely like why, like the city of Detroit being like, you know, case number one again. Um, um, however, uh, there's a few other responses. Um, one would be, I think the vibrant NEO project done for the Cleveland region was very intriguing. It's an Obama sustainable communities era you know, big regional planning initiative. And they have, um, they actually modeled and considered um, not only regional scenarios that how it have total growth in employment and jobs, but also decline. And then they compared if we, uh, let's see, they had two axes to create four scenarios. This is the power of the simple framework. I can remember it off the top of my head. One of them was, do we, you know, basically we st stay the same or grow? And the other one, was do we grow, you know, grow the same way or do we grow differently? And so they're kind of a mixture of growth and actually I come to think of it, it wasn't decline per se, but let's just say stagnant totals, but maybe restructuring within the region. And so, you know, I think they showed, absolutely, they did have to like figure out how to tweak urban footprint to like model decline, um, but they showed that the framework where you have support for it can, in, um, you know, be used to look at a more Rust Belt situation. Um, and then a kind of follow up is the consortium for scenario planning. We've been very aware that a lot of the practice is very growth oriented. Our recent uh, kind of research RFP was around methods for shrinking regions. And I'm a participant. Um, the creators of Community Viz um, have an idea for how to technically model decline. And I've convinced them to do the a small city of um, St. Joseph and Benton Harbor is a twin city in Michigan with a kind of post-industrial past and a lot of racial segregation. And we're getting local stakeholders there to be their kind of guinea pig. So, so, so you know, the, the point is, is that's an area that practitioners and all of us in the field are trying to improve. Um, but I, you know, I completely concede that it's another dimension of planning culture, which is you know that you have to reckon with um, if you're if if you want to implement this methodology in different regions. So um, there, there you go. Uh, so the next question comes from Manish, who asked, uh, "Can you talk more about how your book might help us think about multiple futures where long-standing social processes like race, racial discrimination affect planning outcomes like transportation equity or housing equity?" Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I remember when you when you write a book uh, for academic publishers, and this is published by Lincoln, which has a kind of quasi-academic approach, your manuscript is read by experts. And one of the comments they gave me on the draft is they said, we, you, we have a sense you, you want scenario planning to be different than the way it's practiced. And that was really clarifying for me. And that, that's why I pulled out those ideas about how do we be more emancipatory and address equity better. Equity is a minor theme in a few scenario-based projects, but I don't need here. I'm not super satisfied about it, and I put it in its own chapter. But so that's a, a way of explaining that. Um, let's see what the chapter. I point out that you know we we already know that you can do things like opportunity mapping to empirically analyze um, current equity. You, there are also some examples of you know then taking a further step of analyzing a scenario through an equity lens. So that's being done. Another dimension of equity is obviously inclusion and the politics of planning. I made reference to that case of, e, of kind of EJ activists um, making substantive arguments and shaping the plan. And, you know, but then the final one would be 
you know, take it to its kind of conceptual extreme of like, how do you not only model where we place the affordable housing or something or how transportation can improve accessibility, but also like, what if the underlying mechanisms that produce segregation and, and inequity are modified? And I, no planner has done that. Um, uh, there's a, a strategic planning process that actually some corporate leaders in Metro Detroit ran where they, they had like race relations, you know, their term in the 80s as a major theme and they really discussed it. And I, so I think there's a taboo in professional practice around engaging too much in conversations about race, but I think that's being challenged. And I think there are, you know, counter examples. And another example I mentioned in the book is uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia, which went from in the 90s being uh, you know, overwhelmingly uh, white bedroom suburb of Atlanta to being a very diverse multi-ethnic county with lots of immigrant enclaves. And so the, the uh, scenario-based plan that they wrote um, actually discusses the racial and ethnic diversity and they map out all the communities, they did engagement, and then they kind of build their land use and economic strategy on like speculating about like what if the entrepreneurial activity in some of these immigrant communities we, is reinforced. And so it's again, it's like, you know, from a Black Lives Matter point of view, it's like pretty milk toast stuff, but I thought it was pretty intriguing because it's like a county government that is not afraid of ethnic diversity and talking about it and is, is not afraid of being creative and, and recognizing, you know, not only that these different communities exist and they have different interests, but also like, you know, thinking about how do they relate to one another and how do we build on them as an asset. And in order to, you know, functionally, you know, economic development isn't always aimed at empowering immigrant communities, but that plan kind of gets into that realm a little bit. So, so I guess I don't have a whole lot to tell you, but I did my best with what I learned about, and I have some speculations in the chapter. And, and I'm really excited to see the kind of next generation of practice and uh, where we, we've all read Richard Rothstein's book, you know, we're all, we're all there in a different way than, um, five, 10 years ago, um, or even older, some of these earlier projects. And therefore, I think the stage is set for more creativity. And then um, I see Melissa has a comment. Uh, yep, so Melissa asked, or Melissa said, uh, I work in post-disaster recovery planning with FEMA. I often come across communities that would love to do scenario planning, but they do not have the capacity in house. So they may seek consulting services and that can take a long time. I'm wondering how I can connect these communities to tools or services quickly after disaster. Are there tools that you can recommend with low barriers that are less technological or more intuitive? Um, great question. Um, uh, I've, yeah, there's, um, um, two quick answers. Um, and I'm, uh, doing what you should never do is trying to pull off something in real time here. Um, uh, one answer is one colleague of mine here in my program, uh, Dick Norton, Richard Norton, um, has, um, uh, has done a lot of work um, with uh, coastal communities here in the Great Lakes and has a JAPA article um, where they, you know, and, and the, the climate change impact here is not, um, so the Great Lakes, it's very dynamic, so actually, climate change may mean higher or lower lake levels, as well as more um, increased severity of storms and flooding. And so, um, so anyway, he's created a more streamlined kind of analytical approach of like mapping out those, those options and helping local communities um, under, you know, look at their current land use regulations under alternative climate scenarios. And so um, his whole point was, now he did get some additional funding to do it, but um, as a kind of applied research project, but he is seeking to to systematize it um, as you know. So I think for every you know FEMA category, you know there there might be things like that, which sure it takes some capacity building, but it, but there could be a kind of technical and methodological toolkit that you provide them. Um, and uh, and so that's one answer. Um, uh, it it's that was it's kind of a GIS based analysis. Um, the other. Um, um, the other answer is the, I, I kind of made brief reference to these more qualitative approaches to um, scenarios and scenario planning. And, you know, they, 
the resources that they require, aha, I found it. So is um, now it requires a different type of resource. It requires really an expertise to guide, an expert to guide you through the methodology. Um, but I think in terms of opening up um, interest in the method and creating a, an, an, a space to um, just think about like, what are the hazards we want to con consider and or need to consider. Um, and so the, the, the uh, methodology, um, uh, uh, Jeremy Stapleton um, actually was involved in that Denver case and has recently written this Lincoln publication, which uh, my copy is at home, uh, full color, very detailed workshop agendas, you know, process maps. I mean, it really is like that gets to that nuts and bolts level, which my book doesn't doesn't really get to. Um, and so, if you could interest somebody who either is very intrepid and would like sit down and read this and like try it out, and and it's a little bit intimidating, but like you know, it'll tell you how to do it. Or you know, you just have to create the resources for like the single consultant or something to come in and help you through it. So, um, so anyway, those are a few answers that come come to mind. While we're talking, I'll try to. Um, find the um, um, the other reference. So um, yeah, here we go. So um, this is uh, Dick Norton's work. So it was written, uh, written up in um, Planning Magazine here. And then um, this is the JAPA article um, explaining it. So there you Thanks go. for that. Um, does the um, Lincoln Institute for Land Policy ever have interest in connecting, for example, like in right now I'm working with Hurricane Laura. Um, yeah, what I can say about that is I think I've conveyed the one area of practice where scenario planning is most mature is more in the land use realm, but the consortium for scenario planning has been very interested in making inroads in the hazards area and uh, and, you know, conceptually, one thing that I find exciting about scenario planning is it doesn't really respect these little silos that we have in our field. And it, you know, a, a land use issue can be a natural hazards issue, can be an equity issue all at once. So um, I, I invite you to follow up with me. We would love to talk with you. And we've been making efforts to build bridges to that community. Yep. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box, um, but I would definitely welcome anyone else to ask their questions now. Um, I, do a, I've, I do have one question. Um, so it seems like scenario planning sort of has the potential to bring up kind of uncomfortable or controversial conversations about the future, particularly when thinking about something like climate change. Uh, and I was curious whether in your research or any of the case studies you looked at, whether uh, communities have, w whether uh, communities have sort of encountered pushback about scenario planning as sort of a tool to guide future planning decisions. And if so, how have those communities kind of navigated that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, one example example that Im immediately comes comes to mind um, is um, uh, a case study that I uh, mentioned in the book um, the uh, was in the Austin Texas um, region and it, it was a recipient um, what, what was it called the sustainable places project SPP and it, it um, was a regional uh, sustainable communities regional planning grant recipient to do basically they had already identified communities at the periphery that um, where there was high growth. And so the funding was not to do a regional visioning thing, which they'd already done, but instead look at in very detailed collaboration with the local jurisdictions, not within the city itself, it's these outlying cities, to do basically land use planning um, to accommodate growth in a way that would advance the community's goals. And, and you know, there's an overlay here of um, you know, the sustainability concept in terms of urban form and, and um, that kind of thing. And so anyway, that project, um, there is a, a conservative talk radio host who heard about it. And so you might recall that there was this Agenda 21 conspiracy theory that held that the Obama administration 
through the Sustainable Communities Program was um, seeking to impose UN world order and build super high density housing and you know violate our freedoms or something. So um, that he encouraged people to come to their public meetings. And so then um, I flew down to Austin to collect data and I was a kind of consultant to you know, helping them evaluate their workshops and using new tools. So they had to figure out what to do. And so they, they kind of said um, at the onset, they were like, if you're not here to participate in this project, we'll re physically remove you. And they had a police officer there. And um, it was a little tense, but it was intriguing because some of the people that stayed um, also told me that they like hated zoning and hated liberalism, but they were like not a conspiracy theorist. So it was kind of interesting distinction. Um, they were like, but uh, you know, they're smart enough to know like, yeah, the, the, the municipality does do these things and if they want their viewpoint considered, they should be at the table. Um, but they were willing to participate in what they're just to make a point. So, um, you know, uh, so anyway, that was one, one experience. Um, I, I guess overall though, the way it has played out is I think scenario planning really focuses not on rhetoric and political positions, but more on like the, on, you know, uh, you know, data driven is in the title, kind of on data or the evidence. And, and I, you know, I, it would be an interesting meeting where someone to say, oh, here's the, you know, so the climate change experts I'm working with in this green infrastructure plan have also run into this. They work in various Michigan communities. We have a bunch of Tea Party legislators, um, bright red parts of our state. And they say, well, the first thing, the first presentation we give is always just the historical trend in terms of precipitation intensity increasing, the overall amount of precipitation increasing, which is um, average temperatures increasing. So we don't, we don't even need to talk about climate change. We can just ask today, um, are your plans and policies um, you know, appropriate given the weather we have today and climate we have today? And then from there, they then will get into climate science and you know, the, the various scenarios of the future climate, but they, they, they don't claim to know any which one that they, they present kind of the climate scenario work. So, so they, they feel that that has worked pretty well. Um, so I think that those are, that's you know, some different points of view. I mean, that's something I realize is, you know, let alone what we think about the appropriateness of decisions we're making today for the future, is are the decisions we're making today based on the best knowledge of what the world needs today? You know, we're still widening freeways in plenty of places. We're still, you know, uh, have certain types of zoning. And so the whole act of planning can just be about asking people like, hey, like these are, this is like what's happening. Is this working? Is this what your goal is for your community? And the, you know, the answer is no. I think there's a deeper thing here, maybe a metaphysical issue where um, deeper cynicism about the future will further threaten the viability and support of planning. So that's a kind of cocktail party conversation. Um, I don't know how to think about that other than, you know, there's this element of, you know, of, of hope or pragmatism that the whole profession sort of rests on. And if you kick that out, then you're kind of left with nihilism or maybe just pure politics or something or some other mode of social action. So but I'm still committed to planning, but I gotta say current events are not encouraging. So you know, like, you know, we're all wrestling with that about what is the nature of the practice that we want to commit to. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I see, I see one more question from Christine. Um, she said, I'm interested in combining scenario planning with adaptation pathways by identifying transfer points that indicated it's time to move to an alternate scenario uh, and she was curious what you thought about that mm -hmm. um yeah are uh christine are you referring to the sustainability transitions literature or more from the adaptive management literature or both or uh, more from adaptive management literature okay yeah i some some knowledge there. I, um, what one area of practice um, I think, and this relates to like I showed you that cone, right? So it's very seductive. Can't we? Shouldn't scenarios also be about the path we're going to move through the possible future? That's you know it's a kind of an adaptation lens. Um, and um, I think in certain realms, but to do that, you often have to. Uh, the, the, the challenge in doing that is 
the kind of planning I'm talking, you know, talked about, you can we can appreciate that there's multiple dimensions simultaneously being considered in terms of like the performance and the, and the, the choices of a set of things. So uh, where I've seen people who have a more kind of pathway mindset, it tends to be in planning realms like largely concerning water and water resources planning. And it kind of makes sense because the decisions are, are often just very discreet. Do we build this reservoir project or this pipeline? And also the resource is very discreet and readily modeled. And although there's high uncertainty about climate and about precipitation, you know, if, if you can kind of vary that and deal with that and then, you know, model out, you know, um, everything else and you can see very clearly like oh at this under this climate scenario like we run out of drinking water so therefore we need to like do something else and go on a different path and there's a really great paper um if you email me if you really want it that kind of takes this logic to an extreme it's done by some europeans and they have a very complex set of like decisions and like i'm all for it in that realm um, but i suppose i haven't seen it done more broadly and, and i think it's more because there's just so much complexity like adaption for what end and also the whole evidence of I don't know how would you even identify a transfer point it's is a lot there and, and I think maybe we need to go in that direction maybe people have and I'm not aware of the work but but I think you can appreciate some of the challenges and um, uh, in go in you know that type of more elaborate practice is that helpful do you have any follow-ups or thoughts I'm, I'm totally intrigued by the idea it's and I think is very needed. It's just maybe hard to pull off. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's- Hard to pull off. <laughs> an, a, maybe another element here, like in the environmental field, I come to appreciate there, there's a lot of proponents of adaptive management, but it um, doesn't seem to be implemented in practice because you have to like kind of commit to, I don't know, you, you know, there's still like a political stumbling block of like, even convincing people to manage in a different way. So I guess I'm not sure it's, I think it's a management approach, but I think maybe scenario planning could further the arguments for alternative management, um, um, you know, paradigms, including more adaptation. It's not an either or is what I'm, I'm trying to say. And, and um, because I think like my knowledge of literature, like all the theorists and academics are like, we should all be doing adaptive management and collect it's scientific data real time, but then the reality is hardly anyone does that. So there's so then the question of okay, how do we get to that point? And and you know, cascading ecosystem failures and wildfires. Okay, well maybe you know, um, there maybe the politics are shifting so that and and or maybe scenarios can highlight that um, to be ready and to manage better, we need to you know, re revisit fundamental assumptions about when and how policies are changed. So. But I, I'm, my appointment is not at our natural resources school. So I think I'm pro it's probably like bad adaptive management theory that I'm telling you. So anyway, <laughs> any um, further questions here? I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. So unless anyone would like to jump in with uh, a final question, I think we'll wrap things up around now. All right, sounds great. Well, thanks again for the invitation. And it was great to share the work. And, you know, um, I think your the, que the questions you ask, I mean, I um, really exciting and suggest, you know, I, uh, hopefully you in your different, uh, you know, topical realms or professional careers can take something from this that's useful. And, you know, there's a kind of no shortage of need, I think, for for a field now. And, and I look forward to, you know, learning from you maybe in, in, in terms of following up or making me aware of different resources, um, you know, how we can, you know, better empower communities to plan with scenarios. So um, I appreciate the, the time and best of luck with your semesters, all things considered. Thank you, Dr. Goodspeed. I uh, okay. appreciate you coming. No problem. Thanks.